praise God. There is a word, and it's amazing. I, I thank you, worship team, because we'll be talking about miracles today. Amen. And, and uh, yesterday was my prayer team, and um, when Tina got done, she said that God spoke, and he is moving, and he wants to do a new thing. And I was just like, yep, yep, because this is a... Today's the 16th, but it's actually the 15th day of prayer because we started on the 2nd, okay? So I know that people have been encouraged, uplifted, moved. Some of us have, have done double duty, triple duty, quadruple duty. If, if you all have not signed up, there's still time. There's still slots and spaces, and, but we are not allowing any time to go by uncovered, Amen. And I've seen names on there for of people who I did not know. So people are catching on. People are praying. We're alone. We're getting alone with God, and we're praying and crying out. You know, you guys remember Bishop Clay? He's a one of our coverings. And he said, he prophesied over this house several times that God wants to come in here and do miracles, signs, and wonders. He's just waiting on us. He's just waiting on us. Amen. And so I believe God is speaking this morning. So we're going to look at a passage out of the Old Testament. Forgive my boots. Y'all, they're going to fall down. And you know what? I'm not even going to worry about it. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> I know they're going to fall some more. I, you know, I had to, I'm blaming on the baby. Cheyenne, I'm blaming on the baby. <laughs> I, I just grabbed some boots and got on out the door. Amen. Yeah, we're going to preach. So we're going to look at a, a, a passage in the Old Testament, brother. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. It's a familiar passage. But... Um, it's, I'm going to tell a little joke. It's kind of funny. Um, I always listen to Pastor John Jenkins and the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. And, he, and when he preaches something he's preached before, and he tells the congregation, then he goes, well, don't y'all sing the same songs all the time? Okay. <laughs> so sometimes when you hear something again, it's okay because God gives a fresh. It's a new day right? New, new things happened in our lives. Yeah. We're going to be looking at um, chapter 4, verses 8 through 37. I'm not going to read all of them because that's a lot, but I hope that you do go home and look it over yourselves. So, what we're going to see is that God gave something miraculously and then it was taken back and then he gave it back miraculously God is a miracle worker he's a miracle worker so in this narrative there's two main characters the first one they call the Shunammite woman now she doesn't have a name and sometimes we know in the, in the uh, Bible days, names were very important. But she doesn't have a name. She's known as the Shunammite woman because she lives in a town called Shunem. So uh, I think that maybe she didn't have a name because maybe you and I might just be that woman. We, we may relate to her. We may want to put our names in her place. Here's some things about her and her character. Uh, she was hospitable. We're going to see that she could cook. She was married, but she didn't have any children. She was observant. She was discerning. We're going to see she was relentless. And she was loving. And then the second character, of whom I just love this person, I wish I was there when he was around, the prophet Elisha. 
Minister Annette knows I'm always reading stories and sharing about the prophet Elisha. Not to be mixed up with Elijah, but Elisha with the S-H. Elisha was a prophet during that time. And we'll see he was moving around from place to place, prophesying, healing, advising kings, performing miracles, and all that. And, and what we need to know is that in the Old Testament, the prophets were the mouthpiece of God. They would speak on behalf of God. God would give them a word and they would have to declare it exactly as God said it. And to whom? So it was as if they were God in the earth realm. Does that make sense? They would proclaim his commands. And so as he would pass through Shunem, because it was like a, a, a common route, the Shunammite woman would invite him over to her home for food. That's why I said she probably could cook, okay? Um, and so he came quite often, and she decided to ask her husband if they can build him a room in their house. And it was going to be fully furnished. So that lead, lay, led us to know that she was wealthy. And so her husband had the room built, and every time Elisha would pass through, he would stay in her home. And so one time he came, and he was in his room, and he began to think about how hospitable she was, and he decided he wanted to give her something. So he had his servant ask her, what is it that she needs? And she was like, I don't need anything. I don't need anything. And, and the servant observed, well, you know, she don't have a son. And remember, back then, there were no um, assisted living places for widows. There, were, there wasn't no 401K, no, pro, no um, pension plans. So when a woman was a widow, her son took care of her. And if you didn't have a son, you basically were out. So Elisha called her in the room, and he said, this time, next year, you're going to have a son. Amen? And so here's her problem. Here's a problem. Her miracle son, and I'm calling him a miracle because I believe she was, her husband was old, the, the, the word says, and she didn't have any children, so it's possible she was barren. So if that was the case, then it was a divine intervention. Amen? But here's the problem. Her miracle son dies. Why would God give her something and then take it back? Let's see. So let's look at verses 18 through 23. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. The father said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap till noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It's neither new moon or new Sabbath. She said, all is well. Now ain't that something? The baby died. She took him and laid him in the prophet's room and closed the door, came back, didn't tell her husband, got a donkey and went to look for the prophet. See, during those times, because of the climate and, and the heat, they would bury their dead immediately, most often on the very same day. And another thing they would do is they would begin mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning 
immediately, intentionally, and it would last for days. And the, and the third thing they would do is culturally, you don't touch a dead body because then you'd be considered unclean. So she violated at least three things that they did, right? Now, back to the prophet. So Old Testament prophets had an amazing responsibility, as I explained. They would speak and write the words of God with absolute divine authority. So they were as if they were God. So here she takes the dead child to the prophet's room and lays him in his bed. Okay. So look, if he represents the God in the earth realm, then what I think was that she had a problem. We said that, and that was her son's death. She took her problem to the Lord and laid it there. And then the word says she shut the door and left. I was like, why would she close the door? Was it that she didn't want nobody to see? And I believe God was saying, no, it was to shut her out so she doesn't go back and get her baby. You see, what we do a lot, we take our problems to the Lord and lay them at the altar, and then we come back and pick them up and take them on back with us. See, she shut the door so she could leave her problem at the altar of God. Amen? Then she didn't tell her husband. Wow. She didn't tell her husband. She asked for a donkey and a servant, and she got on the donkey and rode out after the man of God. And she said this interesting thing, all is well. I don't, he said, well, what you going to see him for? It's not a holy day. All is well. All is well. So I don't know, Eddie, if you got my slides early this morning, but the first point is this. If we're going to experience the miraculous power of God, we must learn to take our problems before the Lord, leave them there, and be good with it. Amen. Amen. Because I don't know about you, I, leave, I take my problems. I'm, sometimes I leave it there a few days, but then it just worries me. I'm not good with it. I got to go get it back and worry some more, right? But we have to, if we're going to experience the miraculous power of God, we have to be able to leave our problems with him and say all is well. All is well. Those three words are actually one Hebrew word, shalom. Shalom. What is that? I don't even want to say it. I want y'all to say it. Peace. Amen. To be safe, sound, healthy, perfect, complete. It signifies a sense of well-being and harmony both within and without. That term shalom, it's tranquility, fullness, rest. It's the absence of agitation or discord. It's a state of calm without anxiety or stress. We're talking about shalom, okay? The idea behind the word shalom is wholeness and harmony in relationship with God. You know, we'll call him the Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. Why? Because he desires to bring peace to us. So she says, all is well after her baby died. And you heard all the descriptions or the definitions of Shalom. But I'm going to talk to the ladies because I'm a lady. And men, you probably do it too. How many times, though, do we put on our face, our all is well face, and all really ain't well? Huh, ladies? 
because we carry the weight of the world sometimes on our shoulders, on our chest, in our heart, specifically our families, our spouses, if we have them, our children, we carry it all. And then we get up every morning as if all is well. We put on our makeup. We fix our hair. We get our nails did. We get dressed. We go to school and we go to work like all is well. So we allow that to supersede what God can and wants to do. So if we're going to experience the miraculous power, we got to learn to take our problems before him and leave them there. And if it all, and, and, and take off our masks. Okay? So she had a plot, a plan, a scheme. So she had a problem. She laid it at the altar, but she still had a plan and a plot. So here's what she did. She got on that donkey and she went after Elisha, the man of God. Why? To maybe inquire, this is Karen, maybe to inquire about why you're going to give me something to take it back. Maybe to bring him back. I don't know, but, but she pursued after him and she didn't tell nobody. But it seems the Lord. So let's look at verses 25 through 30. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. That was like 20 miles away from where she was. She rode that donkey for 20 miles. No telling how long that took, right? <laughs> On a donkey to a mountain that she had to probably climb up. Just, just think about it. Get the visual. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to, Gehazi, to Gehazi, his servant, to Gehazi. I've been practicing pronouncing his name. Sorry. Gehazi. He said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with your child? And she answered, all is well. Yeah. And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress. See, all ain't well. <laughs> and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said to him, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And then he said to Gehazi, tie up your garment and take my staff in your hand and go. Basically, he said, go in a hurry. And if you meet somebody, don't even speak to them. Just get going and take my staff and lay it on the face of the child. But then the mother of the child, mamas, you can relate. She says, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. In other words, I ain't going nowhere without you. Okay? <laughs> and look, so he arose and followed her. See, looking in this passage and even in this translation, since I'm in seminary, I, I had to verify what I was going to say. So I checked other translations and some, may, some were a tiny bit different. But as I was reading, and maybe you were following along, I hope you caught that every time she talked about Elisha, she just called him the man of God. The man of God this, the man of God saw her from afar, the man of God said this. But as you look at other translations, and as you'll see later, once he got Gehazi involved, he became Elisha. So I just thought to myself... I think he was out of order. Okay, by sending his servant. He's a God representative in the earth realm. And she was seeking out the Lord. Because remember, she laid her problem at the altar. And he was sending his servant to do what perhaps he needed to do 
for himself. So, uh, she was pressing her way. She was pursuing after God. You know what I noticed too? She didn't even tell Elisha that her son was dead. She was just persistent that he would come back with her. Okay? And not Gehazi. Him. And so, uh, I believe she wanted to know what was going on in her situation. And let's look at point number two. If we're going to experience the miraculous power of God, we must learn to pursue, to press in after the Lord to inquire his plans and his purpose. Amen? Isn't that what she was doing? She got on a donkey, didn't tell nobody what was going on, and rode for 20 miles up a mountain to pursue the man of God to find out what is the plan and the purpose. I got a problem. My son is dead. And I need for you to come back and assess the situation. I remember years and years ago, my um, cousin, her name was Karen West. It was a married name. Some of you may know her, Karen Hancock West. She was murdered by a boyfriend. It was domestic violence. Then he killed himself. And she had two children, and they were still in high school. They had lost their dad, and she, her husband, about two years prior. So now here are these children, you know, without their parents. And I was so angry with God. Anybody ever been angry with God about something? <laughs> you know, just be real. Just be real. You know, I know the old folks, they don't get mad at God, don't question God, but I was mad. And I remember seeking, after a while, first I had to be mad. You know, you got to be mad, right? <laughs> and so then I began to press in to pursue. Why? Why, God? Why? And do you know that he never answered me? He did something better. He gave me peace. The peace that surpasses all understanding. I can't even explain it to you. It was just one day I had peace. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes we pursue after God for his plan and his purpose, and it don't turn out the way we want it to. Or he doesn't even let us know why. He doesn't really have to, I guess. He is God, right? <laughs> he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is all sovereign. He doesn't have to, but I'm grateful for the peace from that day to this day. I'm grateful for the peace. Because a lot of people hold on to stuff for a long, 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 long time. Amen. So if we're going to experience the miraculous power of God, we must learn to pursue the Lord, to inquire his plan and his purposes. So here's the climax of the story. Elisha comes he finds the son in his room on his bed, and he was very dead. He was dead. So look what Elisha does. He shuts the door. <laughs> he shuts the door, and he prays, and he begins to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on the young boy. And he is resurrected from the dead. Amen? Let's, let's look. Verses 32 through 36. When Elisha came into the house, he saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and lay on the child, putting his mouth 
on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and walked once back and forth in the house, and he went up and stretched himself upon him. The child sneezed seven times times. And the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came to him, he said, pick up your son. Amen. That's a shout. All right. Amen. So he he gave her a son miraculously. He was taken back, but he gave her back miraculously. So now the focus shifts from the Shunammite To Elisha. Let me see my next point, please. In our pursuit of God's plans and purposes, we have to get alone with God. Amen. Isn't that what Elisha did? Now, this time, Elisha shut the door with him in there. Okay, so it depends on the perspective, right? So, Elisha shut the door and he prayed. The Hebrew word for shut simply means shut, (laughs) to shut, to close, to close up, to close in. And that same Hebrew word was used in Genesis chapter 7 after Noah had finished building the ark and everybody got in and the rain was about to start. It said the Lord shut the door. Not Noah, not Noah's boys, not whoever was on the ark with him. The Lord himself shut the door. Same Hebrew word. So when the time was right, the 40 days had passed and and then some more days passed when the waters receded. It said the Lord opened the door at just the right time. Amen. The same Hebrew word was also used in 1 Samuel when the Lord said, Hannah, Hannah's womb, the Lord shut Hannah's womb. He shut Hannah's womb, but just at the right time, when he needed Samuel, he opened the womb, and there was born a little boy named Samuel, of whom Hannah gave to the back to the Lord. And we know Samuel, he's the one that anointed King David. You see, the thing is with this Hebrew word shut and the, and the idea that God is the one that shuts the door, what it lets us know that God is the one that's in control of all things. Amen? It is in his timing. And so what, what uh, Elisha did was go in the room and, and shut the door. And remember, he's a representative of God, and he began to pray. You see, sometimes we have to get alone with God and get shut in so that we can shut out the outside noises and distractions. Amen. Sometimes we need to call for a 21, 24, 7 day of prayer, and we need to get in the room and shut the door and shut in to shut out all the distractions so that God can do what he wants to do because he is the one in control. And though and though it might be in his timing, look how long it's been since Bishop Clay gave that prophecy. Amen. And I believe that at the right time, when after we've shut up and shut out and prayed and gave it over to the Lord, we're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders. So he shut himself in. He shut out the noises and he began to pray. And then he got on the boy and he did mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. And the skin began to get warm. But he still wasn't woke. So Elisha prayed some more. And he just kept praying and walking and praying. I don't know about y'all, but in my hour, I've done the several hours. I've been walking and, and praying, <laughs> getting by myself. Yes, listening, talking, asking, praising, worshiping. Okay, opening my Bible, praying the word. Yeah, shutting out the outside noises during my fast. 
I got on Facebook, Twitter. What's my other thing I got? Instagram. I be missing, I've been missing folks too. <laughs> but you need to shut out sometimes. You need to shut out those noises. Uh, and so after he prayed and prayed, it said the little boy began to sneeze. And, and I don't know, I'm not really into numerology, but I'm not saying it's not for real because we know that it is. I just, I just don't study it, so I don't know all the facts or the details, but I do know this. Seven is a sign of completion. I know that. That little boy sne sneezed seven times. <laughs> and then he said, go get his mama. Amen. See, uh, God just wants us to get along with him and pray. Matthew 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. Let's look at the next slide. Because what we're going to see now is the resolution. The resolution. So she had a problem. Her son died. She had a plan. She went and pursued after the man of God. And then she had a, 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 it was a climax to the story. He came back and her son was resurrected. But here's the resolution. She began to worship God. And I believe she got her peace. See, the reward of worship could be our peace. The son is resurrected, and then it says the Shunammite worshiped. The Shunammite's reward was her peace. Verse 37, she came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. He said, go get the woman. She didn't go run in there and grab her baby up. She bowed down to the ground and began to worship the miracle worker. Amen. The one that was going to do things well. The one she sought after and pursued. She was looking for miraculous power. What I learned in my studies was this. The reason why God will sometimes give and take and then give back is to show his power. That he is the one and only true God. He's the only one that can resurrect. He wanted to show his power. See, sometimes our problems and our resolutions even can be temporary. I was thinking about um, um, Pastor Tony Evans, you know, his wife passed away. Um, I act like I know the family because I do a lot of Bible studies. <laughs> and um, I, so I watched the service online, and his youngest son did the at the eulogy, and they were talking about, um, you can come up, Dom, they were talking about, he was talking about how people all over the world prayed for his mother, and, and she still died, and he was hurt, and he sought God, and, and he said God told him, God told him a bunch of things, but the thing that stuck out to me that I remember that he told him, he said, he said, uh, two things happened. This is God speaking to him. He said, now, she could have lived, or she could live. <laughs> you know, sometimes what we want and what God does and wants might be two different things. She could have lived in the natural, but instead she's living in the presence of the Lord, in the spiritual. Amen. So in our pursuit of God's plans and purposes, we begin to obtain peace. And my final, my final slide is my big idea. If we are going to experience the miraculous power of God, we must learn to pursue after God's plan, pursue after God's purpose, so we can obtain peace. So when we say all is well, it's not a facade. So when we say all is well, it is peace. There's an old hymn I'm reminded of that says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. He says, whatever my lot, 
and I'm going to add whatever my circumstance Whatever my situation, whatever my problem, whatever God's plan, whatever his purpose, whatever my lot, thou has taught me to say, all is well, all is well in my soul. Amen, all is well.